a real pleasure to be able to put on this conference, especially one of Mike Rowland for being the local organizer. Without his efforts, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Mignon, who's going to talk about uh, the main theme, uh, which is church science theory. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm really grateful to Ted and Frauke and Roland for uh, putting together this conference. And I'll try to hopefully say something non-trivial about these topics. Uh, can you hear me all right from behind? It's okay. Uh, as many of you will know, um, I'm actually quite a newcomer <laughs> to uh, what, you, uh, what people sometimes call arithmetic topology. Um, so it's only recently I've been doing some reading on previous literature, especially I, I found that Professor Morishita had so many interesting insights on this topic that it would be a pleasure for me even to be able to contribute just a little bit of different perspective, and that's what I'll try to do. Uh, but I don't think I'll have nearly as uh, deep perspective on this interaction between topology and number theory as Professor Morishita has, so I'm looking forward to this talk. So, uh, because um, I'm going to say many things that are quite vague, I said I'd start out with some rather concrete remarks on why there should be a relation between transignment theory and number theory anyway. So let me just remind you a little bit of three-manifold topology as background. So here M denotes a compact three-manifold without boundary. And one way of computing the linking number between two knots that are homologically equivalent to zero in M, for example, two knots in the, inside the three sphere, okay. is to take what, what people call a Seifert surface for one of them. So that's a surface that bounds the uh, one of the knots, right? And intersected with the other knot. So I should have drawn a picture, but I'm not good at drawing pictures, so I did, uh, maybe I can draw one here. So I still can't draw it, but you take some kind of a surface here and see how it links uh, the other node, how it intersects with the other node. So that's how you compute the linking number. And um, the, exact, the exact technical assumption necessary for this, I'll leave to the topologist uh, to clarify. Now, uh, it's also suggestive to write this equality as the linking number between the two nodes being d inverse of one of the nodes paired with the other one. d inverse. You can think of that d inverse in many different ways. For example, as a current, a distribution value to differential form. And then, this surface with boundary will represent this current. And you can think of it as a product of currents. It's not that product of currents is non-technical to define either, but that's a nice way of thinking about it. Uh, now, I thought I'd re describe a little bit, in, uh, uh, rather in this classical setting, what this has to do with transignment theory. Now, you see, from a very dual point of view, you can also define a pairing between one forms, A1 and A2, in a much more simple-minded way, just by taking A1 which product with D of the other form, right, and integrating. That defines a pairing between one forms that somehow mirrors the pairing between knots. And because of this formula on the exterior differential, you see that this product between one forms is symmetry. Okay, now but this pairing up here, of course, if you evaluate it on a single one form A, this is exactly the abelian transignment functional, you know, or sometimes people take k, various k multiples of this as well. But anyways, this is the basic one. You just take A, D, A, and integrate it over the manifold. That's the simplest case of the transignment functional. Right? Now, you can see somehow from the definition that it's going to be related to the linking number but I'll, get, uh, I'll give uh, there are many ways of expressing this relation, of which I'm going to emphasize just one. Namely, this is the physicist's way of thinking about it. I don't really understand these integrals, but I'm going to write it down anyway. So what you do is uh, you take this pairing, so this is the same as the transignment function on here, and take a Gaussian type integral of that pairing, of the exponential of that pairing. Uh, over some space of one form. That, of course, as you know, is hard to define rigorously. But nevertheless, formally, if you take uh, the integral of a quadratic form of this one, you get determinant of that form raised to the minus one half. Formally, if this were a finite dimensional space, this is the, 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 uh, the answer you'd get. 
And in fact, when you do this, a quadratic term, exponential of the quadratic form, together with a linear term, and what's the linear term? So that's when you just take each differential form and pair it with the not. And so there you get a linear function in A. And now remember, we're, differ we're integrating this over the space of A formally. So each of these, you find the function in A, and then you integrate over the space of one form, over some suitable space of one form. So if you did that formally as well, as you know from this process of completing the square and integrating, you get something of this, or you get the previous determinant, but a, a bunch of quadratic terms in the alpha i. This is just a formal analog of the finite dimensional computation. So this term here, of course, is exactly the linking number. But this expression, I think, was, was also the simplest way to see why these numbers come up, because of exactly this Gaussian integral with the linear term. And uh, uh, the people who uh, have seen some of these computations in, I say, quantum field theory know that this is also the analog when you do it with points of Green's function in Cass integral. So let me just, uh, uh, there's another way of writing it that's sometimes suggestive. So that exponential 2 pi i alpha i, the pairing with the not terms, is sometimes viewed as the holonomy of a connection. If you view the one form as a connection on a trivial bundle, you're taking the product of all those holonomies and integrating with respect to this measure. So this whole term with the churn simon term times the dA is viewed as a measure on the space of connections, and you integrate. <coughs> so it's kind of a correlation function of some sort. And the previous uh, expression is expressed showing that when you do that, you get a determinant times exponential of a bunch of linking numbers between nodes. This, I think, is the most elementary way of seeing why Trent Simon's integrals would have to do with knot theory at all. It's because of these Gaussian integrals with linear terms. So, now, I thought I would uh, describe very briefly uh, an arithmetic version of this discussion. As I said, many of these things are based upon previous work that Professor Morishita did, but maybe just from a slightly different point of view. And so it goes like this. So now, x is the spec of some uh, um, ring of integers inside of totally complex number field, and I'll assume that we've trivialized the roots of unity. There are places where you have to be delicate about this choice of roots of unity. I'm going to be completely sloppy in this talk. And just and, uh, uh, freely identify roots of unity and Z mode F as we go along. And so the point is, uh, as you can see, in the previous definition of the arithmetic linking number, a complex of this sort was very important, from one forms to two forms, or one currents to two currents. The knots define two currents, things that you can pair with one forms. Right? And then you took inverse of that and used that to define the linking number by integrating against the other knot. So uh, we're going to do that in this setting where you have a, a ring of integers inside the number field. Now, this is not going to be something at all mysterious because, of course, there are people who worry about defining differential forms in number field in a very fancy way. This is nothing of that sort. It turns out that one, one substitute you can have for this kind of uh, complex of differential form is to just look at this form, this, uh, uh, this complex consisting of h1 of spec OF and some x group here. So this should be thought of ex as h1 and h2, except um, h2 doesn't just quite work when you're using the whole ring of integers. So uh, this is a top homology. And so what, how, is, how is this map D defined? It's uh, something very simple. It's a composition of two things. One is, a, I'm calling a map delta. This is a box time map coming from an exact sequence, z mod n, z mod n squared to z mod n. So this is just a box time connecting homomorphism in cohomology. And the next is a map from h2 to x2 induced by cup product and duality. So let me explain that again briefly. That is to say, in this situation, there is a perfect pairing on Artin Verdier duality between this H1 and X2. This is the old duality of the cohomology of number fields from the 1960s. But there's also a cuff product pairing between H1 and H2 that goes to H3. And H3 of the spec of the ring of integers ends up being exactly Z mod n again. So this is again part of this duality theory that was expounded by Artin Verdier and 
some are popularized by Mazur. Because you have this pairing, of course, each of these H2 define a function on H1, so you get a map from H2 to X2. That was our map R. And Rd was defined to be the composition of the box train operator and this map from H2 to H2, but then X2. As I said, it should just be thought of as being H2, except X2 needs to be serve as a substitute when you're dealing with the whole ring of integers. I'll just make a very, very brief remark. It's not, uh, in a way, it's not very strange to think about the box train as being like a differential. Uh, uh, the reason I thought about this was because this is what happened in one of the constructions of the drum fit complex in characteristic P. Drum fit complex can be thought of as a crystalline cohomology, a sheaf of crystalline cohomology of overriding characteristic P. And then, from that point of view, the differential in the drum bit complex becomes a box train operator. For local fields, this seems to be a reasonably popular theme right now for people working on perfectoid rings as well, but it's a much more simple-minded version of it. Also, the second remark is that if you examine this diagram, so this diagram is where the box train operator will come from, but this also, if you look at the diagram below, the exact sequence below, H1 with coefficients in GM would be GM torsors, and then the map that goes to H2 of mu n is just a trim class map for BM, GM torsor. So that's also very much like just taking curvature of a one form. So in that sense, it's also very much an analog of the D that goes from omega 1 to omega 2. Which remember. Okay, so what does one do with this? Well, okay, if you're given an idea, Remember, this pairing between H1 and X2 allows us to identify the functions from H1 to the Z mod n to just with the class group of OF mod n. So in fact, if, if every ideal defines a class inside this X2, I, I denoted it by I bracket subscript n, that can be just identified with the class group mod n. So each ideal defines a class in there. Now, similar to talking about homological triviality of knots, I'll refer to an idea that's being homologically trivial and homologically trivial if I'm keeping track of the n. If its image inside here is, in, is a boundary of something with respect to this differential, and we're viewing this as a differential, remember, from omega 1 to omega 2, we will say an ideal is homologically trivial if it's D of something inside it. So then, if i and j are n-homologically trivial ideals, we can define their modern height pairing. I, I try to view, because I'm a number theorist, I view this as a height pairing, even though it's also natural to view it as a linking number, uh, by just taking the inverse of one of them. Remember, then that lands inside h1, so I can pair it with the x2 by the duality pair. And then we'll define the height pairing or the linking number. Now, it's straightforward to verify, actually, that this is well-defined, in, in, that is to say, that it doesn't depend on which choice you take inside the inverse, yeah, and that it's symmetric. I'll make a comment about this in a minute. So, uh, that is to say, uh, oh, sorry, uh, so th let me finish what I was saying. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, I think, a, a reasonably interesting arithmetic <coughs> analog of linking numbers that makes it uh, somehow the formalism exactly parallel to what you do in differential geometry. And similarly, you can do this uh, uh, with the, one, the analog of one forms as well. Obviously, we can take the H ones as well and pair them similar to how we paired one form by just pairing A with D of the other, where D lands inside that X group from a moment ago. And so then regarding this pairing, this is also symmetry. And that as a corollary of the symmetry, you can see that the pairing annihilates the kernel of this D operator. Why? Because you can just change the roles of A and B. That means that no, whenever you take something that vanishes under D, it won't affect the pairing at all. So, um, so as I said, if you think about the previous uh, definition a little bit, this, uh, the, the fact that the kernel of D and Ilet is pairing is also shows that the height pairing on ideals is well defined and also symmetric. And I just a quick remark that the reason for the symmetry is that the degree two box time map is zero. That can be verified rather easily from the structure of the cohomology of these numbers. So finally, this is the first case of the arithmetic transimons function on H1. You just take this quadratic form. 
a bracket a in the previous set. So this is a paired with d of a exactly as in uh, as in differential geometry. So that's the first modern abelian arithmetic transcendence. That is a very elementary object to study, but still seems to have some interesting properties. Um, so uh, one needs to generalize this. Actually, sorry, do you have the time? But you can't keep doing that. Thanks. One needs to generalize this just a little bit to actually compute these linking numbers. So the next part is a work in progress. So I'm not 100% confident about the formula, but I think it worked out all right. So, so now let's move to a situation where you've removed a certain collection of places, including all the places that divide n. And I'll use this suggestive notation for boundary of one of these spec of a ring uh, as integers to be the, the disjoint union of the spec of the completions at places in, in S. Now, the previous duality pairing for this open uh, arithmetic uh, curve, or threefold, if you'd like to view it in that way, is a pairing between H1 and H2 compact support that lands inside H3 compact support, which is then, again, isomorphic to that model. This is a generalization. Or, or actually, this is easier than the, the compact case of the pairing in, in many senses, because you don't have to worry about the places dividing in. And using that, you have to, ref to, uh, you have to uh, uh, for this open curve, you have to refine this uh, a little bit to get the map, the complex corresponding to the map from one form to two forms. And I won't go into this in too much detail at all. We can discuss this uh, in, uh, in the afternoon in greater detail if, we're, if you're interested. But you have to replace this uh, thing by a, a, a diagram of this sort, where you have H1, and this is H2 with complex support. And some, there's this thing in the middle is consists of classes together with a lifting to mu n square at the boundary. So this is a funny notation for it, but there's a way to cook up a natural complex that parameterizes H1 classes that locally lift to the bound to mod n square. So you can use this diagram to replace the complex of differential forms in the previous case. So given an idea now, with, with an idea supported on the ring of S integers, what we can do is we can define again its class inside H2 compact support via plus field theory again. Right? Because it will define a function on H1 by a plus field theory. So again, it defines on H2 compact support by the perfectness of the previous pairing. And we'll say, as before, that I is homologically trivial if this class is inside the image of D. But remember now, D comes from here, from this slightly modified H1. The previous H1, but it's natural to say in this situation that it's homologically trivial. And then just define the height pairing of two homologically trivial ideas that are called prime to S, exactly as before. Take the inverse image of one of them. R, remember, takes us back down to H1. Sorry to keep going back to the previous slide. But R is this thing. There's a pairing here. Homologically trivial is defined by being in the image of this map. Right? You take the inverse image and put it, push it down here to pair with H2. So that's the pairing. So that's the height pairing between S co prime homologically trivial ideas. So this as well is well defined and symmetry. All these things need to be checked, and it's mildly technical, but not very hard. But here's how you uh, this relates to uh, I think the previous pairings that we discussed with Professor Morishita. Suppose you take two ideas. I hope this formula is correct. I, I, I tried to maintain. I feel a little bit nervous about it still. Anyway, if you take two ideas in OF supported on the S integers that are n torsion inside the Picard group of XS. So that's the assumption. Now take a function, because it's n torsion, we can take find a function whose divisor on Xs is exactly i to the n. Okay? And let t be the support of the other idea j, and take pi b to be a uniformizer at b, and e v to be the order of the idea at b. So j is pi v to the e v lo locally at b. Then what you can compute is that the previous height pairing becomes something rather familiar. By pairing between i and j, you just take f, the component at b, and pair it with pi b to the e b. And sum of it. So these are the symbols with the sign power symbol. So again, this is 
pretty much all uh, studied very well by Professor Morishita, but I'm just putting it into a formalism that reflects what happens in differential geometry more closely. Okay, so that's uh, how you would compute this pairing using formulas like this. I'm not going to show you any explicit computations today. But I will remark that you can link the trans Chern Simons invariant to a uh, linking number, the arithmetic linking number, in sometimes much more easily here. Everything is rigorously defined. That is, you can consider. So this is the analog of the integral of the Chern Simons function from three manifolds, right? You take exponential 2 pi i rho bracket rho, where rho runs over h1. h1, remember, it's now supposed to be like one form. And take. Uh, 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 the exponential of that. Uh, sorry, this is, the, by the way, the compact case. You have to modify this story, which I'm not going to do today for the open case. Anyway, so these are supposed to make the differential one forms, remember? Sum over rho is the exponential of the transcendence function. You can also do it with a linear term, as before, where this rho is being paired with the class of a set of homologically trivial ideas. So this is a quadratic plus linear exponential sum. Uh, so now to evaluate that, uh, so it, it should be possible to generalize to, to this the down prime case, but so far I've only worked this out for p equals n is a prime. So we let a be the dimension of h this h1 of the and b be the dimension of the kernel of the d operator, right? So d, since k is the, uh, sorry, I forgot to say k is the kernel of d. So you, you get an induced isomorphism from H1 mod K to simply to the image of the D is just defined to be the kernel that I'm denoting by D bar. Then the formula for that sum, which exactly uh, mirrors the previous discussion on differential on three manifold, is that if you sum this exponential of the quadratic plus linear over the differential one form, so to speak, integrate over the space of differential one form, you get exactly the same kind of thing you find in geometry that the determinant term, there's a bunch of powers of p, uh, powers of i, and then you get the linking numbers showing up here. Here's my number. And the proof is completely formal, similar to how you would actually compute Gaussian integrals of uh, finite dimensional spaces. This determinant needs to be remarked a little bit. Th this d, because it's actually going from a space to its dual, you can't quite take this determinant. It's only the defined modulo square. But that's OK, because it's appearing inside of the Jungler symbol here. So it's actually the determinant of a quadratic form, not of a linear. OK, so that's kind of the mo only, I would say, possibly the only concrete part of this talk. But I thought I'd at least present some things that indicate that something interesting is going on. And um, uh, so among the kind of questions I think one needs to face when looking at this formalism is I find it anyway suggestive that there's something uh, broader and deeper than just a superficial formalism I got like here. But one is how do you not take a limit over n? So this is like these are all like omega differential forms mod n. And how to take a limit over n? I think there should be a way to do it, but it's not obvious at all because of the way the box time maps will be. Okay, so that's the, these are general. No, no. So now let me step back a little bit and talk about a few things <coughs> for which uh, uh, certainly Professor Morishita is the top expert in the world. So we're going to step back a little bit, remind ourselves of these analogies, which, which I've already alluded to. So I'm going backwards a little bit. As I said, I want you to talk about something concrete first. We'll take x to be spec of OF as before. This is supposed to be similar to a three manifold, a compact three manifold. And then if you have spec of a residue field of OF embedded inside spec of OF, it's supposed to be like a knot inside the three manifold. And the, this analogy continues. If you take the completion around a place V, that of course that's like a formal neighbor of the spec OV. So that uh, it's an old story in algebraic geometry that it should be like a tubular neighbor of, of, of your closed subscheme. So that should be like a solid torus around your knot. But then if you, uh, instead of spec OV, if you take spec FB, that's removing the knot in the middle inside the solid, solid torus. So you get left at the top. Essentially, that's homotopic to the torus at the boundary. So that's like a knotted torus. And XS 
if you remove S from spec of F, there should be like the original compact three manifold with the boundary tori with the solid tori being removed. So there should be pictures for all of these, but I was too lazy to draw it. And then we know that uh, the fundamental group of X sub S, the ring of S integers, will be the Galois group of uh, the maximal extension of S unrarified outside S. And it's supposed to be like pi 1 of 3 manifold with boundary. And then the Galois group of the local fields should be like the pi 1 of the boundary components. And then if you remove sufficiently many S, most of the time this should be like hyperbolic 3 manifold. So that's an old analogy that's been known since the 1960s, or people discussed since the 1960s. But I'll remind you, there's also this dual view, which is also described in Professor Morishita's wonderful book. <coughs> Namely, what is the dual view? Well, you can take a knot. If you have a knot and a three manifold, you can be interested in on its own, or you can view it from the perspective that it defines a function on bundles with connection. Of course, this already came up earlier. And we Holonomy. Right? So you just take, for example, the trace of the holonomy uh, of the bundle of a bundle with connection uh, around your knot. So that's a function. Similarly, if you have a prime inside some ring of S integers, you can view it simply as a function on Galois representation. And number theorists are very used to this. We, we study this all the time for various reasons. So if you have any Galois representation, you can take uh, since uh, V is outside of S, this is supposed to be a representation of ramified outside S, so we can take the trace of the Frobenius element at V acting on your representation. But that's a very important quantity in a theory. Now, so you could argue that uh, even more fundamental than the analogy between knots and, trim, uh, and primes, the analogy between bundles with connection and Galois representation. And one of this connection, of course, is what physicists study in some form or another all the time. I tend to view this as a more fundamental analogy than between knots and primes. Of course, there are different perspectives. It's funny, even, even if you're not interested in this arithmetic topological uh, considerations, people seem to have different views about this. So for example, I was going through uh, this. Uh, so, uh, some of you know I've been studying arithmetic fundamental groups for some time. So I was looking at this old paper of Bihara. And uh, he has this funny remark that the goal of class field theory is to understand completely the structure of all primes. I don't know whether you agree with that or not. That seems to be something that doesn't quite agree with my view. That is, I think all our representations are interesting on their own. <laughs> Some people think it's just a way of studying primes. So here you can change the perspective. I think that you can say primes are interesting because they are functions on all our representations. That's another perspective.